Hello, you're listening to Connect, Collaborate, and Create with Lisa and Devo. Each week on our podcast, we will discuss and dissect ways we are attempting to live our best life through our business, our personal lives, and connections and relationships we forge that make us successful. Oh my boy. <laughs> I like how Ben came in earlier. <laughs> All right, you ready to do this? Mm-hmm. All right. All right, so good morning, episode six. Devo here. Lisa Stout. And well, this is episode number six. I'm loving yeah, this. Mind body, <laughs> mind body business. And um, today we have two fantastic guests on, um, kind of very timely in the sense of how we brought them on in terms of uh, the period we're going in, but just kind of everything's going on with uh, shifting of people working from home and people having to basically live quarantine life. So we have uh, Jessica De Silva. She is a relationship recovery coach. And then Ben Duick from, he's from Canada. Can, he's from Canada. Winnipeg. Winnipeg. And he is a former executive turned executive development coach. And the two of them are going to kind of come on and talk a little bit in terms of making this pivot, this shift from uh, being in a corporate brick and mortar type of concept to suddenly being confined to quarters and having to work from home, as well as from a relationship perspective, everybody's all under the same roof. How do we all get along and kind of stay in love or at least not stay alive, stay alive, not just kill each other and also be productive as both an employer and an employee. So I'm really excited to do that. But before we kind of jump into them and um, we'll have them on here in a minute, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we have seen as as we're small business owners, right? Yep. And we're photographers, but we also have a digital media company. And so um, it's kind of interesting to see as photographers, we hear a lot of people. And I was having a conversation with a photographer on Friday and she was just like, I don't really know what to do. You know, I'm just kind of like trying to figure out how to make money and all my clients are rescheduling or canceling everything. And I'm having to give out refunds and all these sorts of things. And so it kind of, it kind of, We thought it'd be kind of appropriate to talk a little bit about as photographers, but it's applicable. To be honest about it. Yeah. You know, what it's meant to us, but it's applicable to all businesses, all small businesses and and people that have just found a huge shift in what's happening in their lives. Yeah. So so suddenly you wake up and honestly, it just kind of did happen overnight. In a matter of two short weeks, you were you were running a full scale operation. And in two short weeks, you're basically scaled back to zero, saying that you can't interact with anyone. You can't go to work. You can't all these sorts of things. And and there are different ways that people have dealt with that and responded to that. Of course, some people have jumped all in and just like I'm putting on the mask and I'm going into my scuba Steve outfit and I'm not going to ingest any anything. And there's other people who kind of like toe in the line a little bit and kind of stepping across here and there. But either way, you know, the financial burden that has kind of presented itself through this, for, especially for small businesses mm-hmm. that are brick and mortar, whether you retail, it's it's a it's a on the surface is an insurmountable challenge, right? It was almost like a switch was flipped. And we were we were driving back from a job, actually. And all of a sudden, all my emails were there had been a specific speech the night before that kind of instilled what was going to be happening. And all my emails were cancellations, rescheduling, all of that. And that's probably across the board for most businesses. All of a sudden it was a shift in, you know, a a screeching halt for Mm -hmm. a lot of things. Yeah. So number one concern, I think for most people is financial, you know, we're like, Oh my gosh, what, what are we going to do? Yeah. And it's funny. And and I'm not going to go into my conspiracy theories around any of this, but as humans (laughs) and as business owners, especially Mm -hmm. small business owners, we rely heavily on our network, our community, Mm -hmm. And especially in the wedding industry, it's a very small, tight knit community. Everybody kind of knows each other. A lot of people and not even wedding, but even like me working with magazines and stuff like that, all these connections that you make any Mm -hmm. of your other clients, too. It's it's a very um, it's a community. Yeah. And suddenly being told that you can't visit or go to networking meetings or have coffee with, you know, some of your colleagues or whatever it is, you, you can no longer do that. And so just right off the bat, you're like, what am I supposed to do now? And, and a lot, I I know for, for myself personally, and I'm sure a lot of people that love what they do, you get a lot of your creativity. You get a lot of um, energy. You vibe off of being around other people. It it gives you that. And all of a sudden you're not mixing with these other people. You don't have that interaction. You don't have that escalation of that vibe. So that kind of like, it's deflating. Yeah. So honestly, it's a perfect storm in a matter of 
in a manner of speaking for small business owners and for people in relationships as well. And you're going to talk a little bit about that before we jump into it. Cause you have a really cool term and I can never remember what you said, but I know you, you were going to, remember. <laughs> but you know, we kind of, we, we were running full steam as a photography business. It was January. That's our biggest booking season. We just kind of rolled right into January. Then February came around and, and, and from both of our perspectives, we had a really full schedule of upcoming weddings and engagement sessions and all sorts of stuff. And then suddenly it came to a screeching halt, and you're like, I had all this momentum built up as a small business owner. And then suddenly through no doing of your own, everything that you had planned for, everything that you had, had put together for your upcoming, you know, your quarterly statements in terms of your plan, your budget, all those sort of things suddenly was just come to a screeching mm -hmm. halt. And you're like, um, what am I going to do to make money? And, a lot and of people we, are yeah. that way. And right? we don't mean to be a buzzkill on this, but I think this is the way that most people are feeling like, and it's, it's, you know, you, you're wondering, you know, is it sink or swim? And for us, what we do is not, I don't want to say we're not necessary, but it's a luxury item. So what, what is As that? Pho the photography thing. For photography, yeah. for photography. So what's the new normal? So you think are people who are struggling with finances and figuring things out and going to have money for this, even once it's over, you know, what's going to happen with our business model? Yeah. So it's interesting. And right now we're kind of talking about some of the challenges that, that we um, have both found on our photography side of the business. And so again, obviously the financial implications, um, the inability to hang out and collaborate and network with people that you so heavily rely upon a lot of times. And suddenly that has changed and altered. And then, you know, you have all this sort of new idea around isolation and we are as a human species, we're a community based communal organization of, of people. We interact, we engage, we like to touch, we need that physicality and suddenly putting us in isolation, taking away our financial means and not being able to interact with people. There's a whole bunch of other things that happen. And as a business owner, it's like, how do you, how do you function with this? And I think if you look at the data and you can Google this to fact, to get fact based information on it, but you know, Incidences of depression have gone significantly up, um, and you, you're going to talk a little bit about your piece of it. But financial, <laughs> no, no, in terms of uh, when couples have the what do you call it, the perfect storm? What's your terminology? Oh. I'm going to get that but anyway, so <laughs> so not to be the sour grapes here, but we wanted to kind of talk about some of the challenges, and we get it, like we understand it. And for me, I really had no other choice but to just stand up and fight. And I'm. I think a lot of people have curled up in a ball. I've, I've spoken to a lot of people where I've had to kind of like, honestly, Jessica will appreciate this, but therapeutic sessions, like what the F man, like you, it's sink or swim time. And, and if you don't start thinking about creative ways to generate more income, either for this business that you have now or a new business that you want to start, like you're not going to be around in six months when this hiatus opens back up. And so we thought we would present some of the, some of the ideation that we have done, right? Some of the opportunities, because I, I personally, I believe this wholeheartedly, you know this, I think that this, as challenging as it will be, is currently and potentially going to be, I see there is a shit ton of opportunities through all mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. to pivot your business, change your model, change your way of thinking, and come out of this a bigger, better, stronger person. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So I think the term that we were talking about yesterday, we said it's kind of like the refiner's fire. And we feel like it is in both business and personal. Um, and we'll probably talk about that. But we feel like it's it's that opportunity, whether whether you're in a relationship, but Jessica will talk about this, and you're you're stuck with this person, it's it's that time to make or break to decide, you know. Are you guys stepping up to this or do you decide after being quarantined that you're like, Meh. and same with your business. Like it's the refiner's fire to see if you can come out the other end. What are you going to do to keep that business going to pivot and do all that you can? Or maybe you want to shift your business. Maybe that's the time to, to decide that this isn't for you. And this is what you, you know, the opportunity for you to do something else. I like how you just bridge those two because I was trying to explain why we had Jessica and Ben on at the same time, but I felt like I was fumbling around my words and you just literally bridged that gap. So what played? Mm -hmm. So, Oh, we're doing the high five. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> for me, um, we were already in the process of starting a second business line. We've been working on that for about eight months, almost a year. Uh, so we were trying to get it to a space where we could really start morphing our traditional photography business into more of a digital asset generation, content creation, and then it kind of morphed into some other things. So, but we're not unique. Like, no, I you, think a lot of people are in that, that you're almost order taking, whether, whether you're an entrepreneur or in your job, you're just, you're running to stand still and getting all those things done and all those other things stay on that back burner. Well, 
here's a perfect opportunity to bring them to the forefront. So maybe you were already doing some other stuff on the side. You know, maybe you're a corporate employee and you had this small stay at home business that you were working on in the after hours. And I know a lot of people do that. And, and, and maybe now that opportunity is going to, this situation is going to free up a lot more time for you to focus and make a pivot into that opportunity. Maybe whether it's education based, whether it's maybe organizing that new opportunity, we're talking about everybody has them. And I, I have a hundred items on it of things that I write up on a, a chalkboard or on a whiteboard is like, that would be really cool if I could do that. Like not bucket list stuff. I'm not like talking about traveling to Costa Rica and bungee jumping with a monkey. I'm talking about like, <laughs> I'm talking about like real projects yeah. that you want to do. Right. And so it's kind of interesting. Now we have, honestly, we have an inordinate amount of time at our disposal where we're not just driving to and from work, sitting in, in, you know, traffic jams and, you know, Jessica's in California. So I used to live there. It took me an hour to get to work. So now we're just sitting here with all this time. And maybe now it's time to take some of those items off that list and, and reassess how they might be able to actually fit into mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. in, in terms of a revenue based or a passion based, or maybe it's a giving back ordinance or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so the first would be just pivot, figure out what are the things that you're really good at? What are the things that you really love? and maybe put some value and time into that, mm -hmm. right? Would mm -hmm. you agree with that? Absolutely. Another one would be connecting and collaborating with other people. Um, it's a great time to connect with those people that you just haven't had time to, to collaborate with them. And we've had so many examples, even if you're looking at social media, I know from my small community, I'm in Hilton Head, there's being some people that, you know, their business is, is the model has changed right now, but they're doing shout outs. They're doing things and, and talking about other people in the community that are doing great things, bringing to light other businesses or actually setting up. Um, we actually had someone on the show a few weeks ago that had actually set up, um, uh, what would you call it? From Leah. You're talking about Leah? Yeah. So it's a, it's a nonprofit organization yeah. that she had set up that to help the community that pulled in a bunch of other community leaders in, in the restaurant and bartending and kind of like food, food mm -hmm. and beverage business mm -hmm. and set up this, um, it, you know, they do food delivery. They're doing, they're doing food sharing where everybody brings all of their different takeouts to one look. Anyway, the yeah. bottom line, what you're getting is she, is she didn't just roll up in a ball. She's like, what can I do at this she connected point with her community? She's collaborating with people as are a lot of other people that they're just mm -hmm. stepping up. And just because you, just because you're confined to a home. I mean, honestly, if you truthfully stop and think about it, the last five years in, in social media has been around longer than that, but the, for the last five years, it's almost been a ramp up build up, getting us to the point where we are now. It's like, okay, we've given you the tools, whoever the we is or ubiquitous somewhere has given us these tools, social media. And we're now, we've been practicing for three, four or five years and how to use it effectively, as opposed to just posting, you know, photos with you wearing sunglasses around your head, somewhere on a beach doing something, a dance with your cat. Now there's a <laughs> real reason where you can connect with people. You've got tools at your disposal where you can reach out and engage and we do it. We're living proof that it's possible because honestly, I've made I've made some of my strongest connections over the last month mm -hmm. with people doing this podcast, engaging in collaborations and partnerships that we're doing virtually. And so to say it's impossible, you're completely wrong. You just got to jump in and get at mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So we had a list of like 20 items okay, that we're, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. These. So all right, you reassess our business model. Really perfect like time. One. And that doesn't mean making a go back in and writing all those things. It's just no, kind of right. like, look at your business. What are you doing? What Sometimes makes sense? Sometimes you get so into it that you forget what, what you started out with. Mm -hmm. And is that still your goal? Is that still your mission? Yeah. I like the one uh, that you talked about in terms of if you're a photographer or if you're just whatever your business is, reorganize yourself and kind of get everything lined up. What makes sense? Throw out the trash. It's baby in the bathwater time. Like if things don't roll for you anymore, get rid of them. And that, I mean, Jessica, I hope will agree with that, but that goes for relationships and your life like this. For me, this should be a life transformational period for you where you actually get time. Should I be worried? No, you shouldn't. <laughs> but you have time to like focus on yourself and your family and your business and your careers and all the things that you might have always wanted to clean up but never had. And this is not like New Year's resolution, resolution shit. Like, don't just make a list of 18 things that you want to do, get skinnier, get prettier, do dumbbell lifts every day. Like you got to dive into this stuff and actually get some meat and potatoes out of it, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, it's time for reassessing and strategizing mm -hmm. digital marketing and social media and your website. Perfect time to do it. None of us really like doing it and we always put it on the back burner. It's 
perfect time to do it. Well, here's the thing. And, and we talked about it all the time is that people think, oh, I, can't. I had a conversation with a photographer on Friday. She's like, I'm so scared. I don't know what to say. What do I do? I don't have anything to content to say. I was like, you've been talking to me on the phone, girlfriend, for almost an hour. And honestly, you haven't shut up. You have plenty to say. Like, <laughs> you, No, for real. Like, You just told me all these things that, that you like and the things that you miss. And you talked about how you love engaging with because you had coffee once a week with your clients. Well, what the hell? Get online and start connecting with them. Engage with them. Reorganize. And what? what the point of all this is like sit down and think about your social media options and what's going to be your best bang for your buck are you a linkedin nerd are you an instagram nerd are you a facebook like what is it that really works for you or can you kind of organize a strategy around all three of them so that here's the point you're not trying to be narcissistic by being on social media okay when you have social media and you have a channel the point is is to engage with people grow your brand and ultimately scale your company by doing so by your brand awareness by your connections and if there's one thing because we're running out of time if there's <laughs> one thing <laughs> if there's one thing that we want everyone to take away during this period it would be what what would you say that one thing is hire us as photographers no but <laughs> <laughs> build relationships. It's this is the time to build relationships. Relationships and and strengthen the ones you already had and and strengthen the ones that you are living in in terms of your romantic relationships, your children for example. Like there's all sorts of different ways that we're looking at our lives and be like how can we make a better version of ourselves when this new normal comes back online, which it's slowly kind of morphing right now as we speak. And so building those relationships, your work relationships, your networking relationships. There is a bevy of different things that you could do right now with your wedding group or your photography group or your small business group that where you could all get together and start planning or at least connecting for virtual coffee and all that sort of stuff. Just letting people know you're yeah. still here, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. There's so many things we have I to talk know. about. I know. Online education. There's mm. so much. Okay. So anyhow, bottom line is don't curl up in a ball. Find ways to be innovative, creative, connect with people, collaborate, and start creating something, okay? All right, so our first guest, we're, is that our kind of our intermission yeah, schedule? Yeah. All right, so <laughs> do, do we need new music for this? Um, uh, did, she, did Jessica give us a song? No. Okay, I'm going to bring in Jessica right now. All right, so Jessica, <laughs> let me just get her up here on the screen. I kind of like the live cast piece because oh, we've got some comments from people. You want to respond to those comments while Jessica comes online? I need to put my glasses on. <laughs> Hello. There yes. she is. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear. So I get a song. We were working on a song, but you didn't have one for that intro. That's what I'm saying. We're we we can <laughs> sing. We can sing to you if you want. No. You All right. So Jessica, you. meet Jessica. She, you're out in Southern California, right? You're SoCal, right? Or North? I'm California. actually. I'm originally from California, but I'm in Vegas right now. Oh, do you? Are you work, living and working in Vegas? I am living and working in Vegas. Yeah. Okay. So you are the relationship recovery coach. You're also a former mental therapist. Um, you've done hypnosis practitioner. I need to learn a little bit more about that because I tried to self hypnotize myself last week and I'm still not sure where I am. Uh -oh. And then, so your whole byline is you kind of, I'm assuming, otherwise you wouldn't be talking about this. You came from a series of toxic relationships. Um, is that correct? You were kind of like, self capitulating into that and you realized you were aware and awake enough that this is something that needs to be addressed yes. internally. And so you went back to school and, or you were already in that space, but either how now you're helping couples, women kind of overcome that repeating pattern of just being in self deprecating, damaging relationships. That's kind Honestly, of, Honestly, that's an epidemic. And right? it's not just for women. I know your market caters to women, but men do the same thing. I, you know, you, you start no, up I cater to both right? men and women, but I think my mm. brand is a little bit more feminine. And so men don't think that it's catered to them, but it's to both uh, single men and women that I cater to. So I first met you and I was trying to go back in my Instagram because I uh, went, was trying to figure out how long I met you. And I met you on Instagram over a year ago. I've been following you and I, I think you follow me. You better be following me. I do. And, <laughs> and you were talking about, there was a post you did on, it was about self-love and how one of the, the roots of our problems in dating is at the core of it, it's, it's the lack of self-love. And that really um, resonated with me because that was a, that was some, something that I had personally struggled with for a long time. You know, I, 
call it whatever psychology you want, but I grew up in a family of 12 kids and there was very little attention given to one over another, even though I was my mom's favorite, I was my dad's least favorite. So that's a whole different session with you. But nonetheless, like, you know, I grew up into a series of relationships. I got married to somebody who I truly wasn't in love with. And I was dating people that pr probably weren't the best for me. And it wasn't until I realized after my divorce that, man, I, I was just as much responsible for being for that divorce and for that life as anyone. And, and at the root of that, it was like, I don't know if I really have, actually liked who I was. So I loved what you were saying about it. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say about it. So just tell us a little bit about after all that, just kind of who you are, what you do, where people can find you, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I specialize in helping both men and women uh, really end their toxic dating patterns, find more freedom in their life. Because when you're in those relationships, it's so constraining and limiting to, you know, your mind, body and spirit. Right. And how you just can express yourself in the world. Um, and then I also help people create just healthier, strong relationships. And like you said, you know, you can read it through the posts I make. What I do is really based off of my own personal experience, about 15 years of toxic relationships with different people. But it's really like a generational thing. Um, it's, you know, my grandma was in a toxic relationship. My mom was in a toxic relationship. So, of course, I, you know, modeled that behavior. And, um, and I had to just take it upon myself to realize, okay, I need to do something about this. I need to change the way... I relate to myself, change the way I relate to others so that I could experience a healthy relationship. Like I want to be happy. I want to feel at peace with my partner. And so I find, you know, I went to school, um, got my bachelor's in psychology, went to, uh, got my master's in marriage and family therapy and just learned the tools and techniques to really, you know, improve my mental health and love myself so that I could attract a healthy partner and maintain that relationship as well, not sabotage it. So I help my clients do the same thing. You talked about a couple of really cool exercises and, we'll, and we're going to get into a little bit deeper, but one of the things you talked about was uh, that I loved in one of your, I downloaded one of your articles and it was about a lot of the patterns that we find ourselves in as adults we either learned or were passed on to us as children in terms That's of- That's what I want to talk about too. Is that what you're going to jump in? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's crazy. And I'm a father. I have two girls and it's crazy. I always think about, because I, I'm aware of that as well. And I always think about that, you know, what message am I teaching my children that they're going to hold on to that would be beneficial to them or it's going to totally- F them up. I'm like, right. I, I tow that crazy line between, am I, should I share that? Should I say that? Should I not say that? Like, and honestly, truthfully, as an adult, we think because we're adults, we're supposed to know everything. I don't know shit. I know. So I don't like, I don't, I'm learning something new every single day and I don't know how to raise kids the best way. And I'm thinking about all the crazy stuff that I learned as a child. You're it's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You carry mm -hmm. that into mm -hmm. your, your, your presence. Absolutely. And I think we don't notice that. And, you know, there's a turning point in our lives, but you're talking about things that change the quality of your life and trickle into everything else, you know, your happiness and bring everything else up to a different platform. But, uh, you know, it, I've talked to my sister about this too, that we just thought that the relationship that my mom and dad had were, the, it was the same as all other parents, all other kids' parents were. And if my mom was, I can say this because my mom doesn't follow me or have yeah. social same in with my mom. <laughs> I can say these things and be safe. But you know, I would see You're her not her favorite kid, apparently. I'm not her favorite. My mom so follows fine. me on <laughs> But she would be sitting in her bedroom like for days in the dark. Wow. And you're just like, what's going on? And obviously there was like relationship problems that we figured that out later, but it's it's what you grow up with and you just think it's normal. Yeah, you think it's normal. And I mean, with me, like I had friends who you know i observed i'm very observant right so i saw their parents and a lot of them were still married and i would i would question like what what makes them a healthy couple like why are they so happy together and so that's when it really got me thinking that maybe there's something i'm missing here like maybe there's something i can learn so that you know i can have that same experience um but yeah, it's, you know, they say from the ages of zero to seven, we're sponges. So we're just soaking in all of this information. There's no filter really. Um, so those are really pivotal years of really, um, you know, constructing our beliefs and our ideas about the world and about ourselves. 
All right, so we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into some of the things that you're doing. One last piece before I bring in our next get, uh, guest. Let me try that again. Our next guest, Ben, um, is I saw in one of your journals or in one of your articles, you talked a little bit about manifestation and abundance and law of attraction kind of stuff. Is that kind of where, so that, does that play I dabble in there, yes. Yeah, like that. <laughs> so that plays a... <laughs> She's a <prophet. laughs> Is that, the, is that the virtual symbol? I don't know. For That's just, I, I don't just know. Sounds good. <laughs> I think we did that in yoga last night. We did. Did you? Candice does that in one of her uh, tantras, mantras, mujos. Um, okay, you're getting somewhere. I'm going to interrupt though because before we get off today, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you, and I want to ask you how we independently decide when enough is enough. When do you figure that out, and when do you make that transition? So at some point, I want you to answer that. Oh, well, wait, she, Lisa, can you repeat that? Because it just froze for a second. Um, I just kind of want to know, because we've had conversations. I was in a, a, a long marriage and went through certain things. I won't get into it. But, you know, I think a lot of us go through things and just either figure that we'll endure or that this is normal or, you know, it comes in such small segments that mm -hmm. you just sort of get used to it. So at what point? or how do you make that shift that you say enough is enough? So mm. maybe if you want to think about that answer for me, what an easy sure. answer. Because some you of us go back and go, it's been, it's been a decade. Why didn't I figure this out X right. amount of time? How can you help people to make that decision and be aware? Do All right, you want so that I'm... answer now or later? If you have that answer, yeah. Well, it's totally, I mean, I'll just like really quickly, I think that using your feelings as a guide is so important. Like, you know, you know, our, our feelings aren't the enemy, right? It's really just communicating to us what we're going through. So it's just, if you're consistently feeling in pain, feeling bad, then that's an indication, right? That's your body, your soul communicating to you that perhaps you're not in the right situation and you need to shift that. So it's just being aware of, you know, how you're feeling. And if it's too consistent, if it's very consistent, then perhaps you might not be in the right situation. Right. So that, but that's that a whole other goes over into Ben as well into our, into our employment situation as well you, as like all relationships. He hasn't gotten right. this on. Oh, wait. So ben, ben you're going to get ready. I, I, I'm on here. Introduce. <laughs> <laughs> from is it Manitoba? Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Hey, Ben, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. So our next guest that are, that we're going to have a kind of a longer extended conversation with, with Jessica around is Ben Dweck. He is from Cantera Leadership. Um, he's a Canadian, but obviously in today's day and space, the point of what he does can be done virtually. In fact, one of the workshops you offer, executive leadership coaching programs you offer, it's, it's online based, right? Absolutely. Um, and the name of your company is Cantera Leadership. We'll put that up there. So I was trying to figure out what Cantera means, and I saw a couple of different definitions. It means quarry in Spanish, which is kind of like a school, right? Is that kind of what the... Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the foundation of it. It's actually from a, a business that I was uh, operating previously that was actually a, a construction company, and we figured Cantera, quarry, kind of building a solid foundation. I thought it fit well for leadership development as well. Yeah, I like it. So so then the definition we had was perfect for it. So um, I was trying to find it earlier and I kept on putting two R's in that. That's why I couldn't sort it out. But <laughs> so you have you are the president and founder of Cantera Leadership. I'm saying that right. And yes. um, you have a master of arts degree, I believe, in leadership effectiveness. So which I need leadership. To MA in leadership. Yeah. <laughs> so I, need, I want to learn a little bit more about that. So you actually go back to school and what sort of coursework do they teach you to be a leader? Are you yeah, you know, it's an interesting question, right? Because a lot of times leadership is more of an art than a science, right? So how do you define it? How do you teach it? And I think a, a big part of some of the material we went through, a lot of it was around even just asking that question, how do you define leadership? Uh, but then taking it to the next step and saying, now, how do we apply some of these concepts of leadership to a lot of different contexts? So there is courses on called results-based leadership. So how do you lead in a way that drives results? There is uh, introduction to leadership. There's team building and conflict resolution, right? So some of those kind of ideas and how do you build the uh, those kind of structures within your leadership, whether you're a large organization or a small, that was kind of some of the the topics and it was fantastic. I mean, I learned a lot about myself even more so uh, than than anything else which uh, I think is an important part of leadership development as well. So early on in your career, I saw something about being part of you were voted in as the Manitoba Youth Leadership Council president or something like that in terms of 
um, being involved in politics. You've also been involved in the Chamber of Commerce world, the corporate world, and now you're doing the private entrepreneurial stuff. But growing up as a child, are you an only child or do you have siblings? Siblings, older and two younger. So growing up as a child, it's interesting, and I read this, I read a lot of leadership books, and, and there was there's kind of one singular trait that, well, there's a lot of singular traits, but one in particular that always jumps out at me is they always felt a little bit different and a little bit more unique as a child. Um, and they always kind of found themselves in some sorts of roles of leadership in one form or another. Did you see that in terms of as a child that that was kind of looking back, that that was a pathway that you that you should have been taking anyway? Yeah, I had lots of opportunities to figure that out for sure. I, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, which I think is a is maybe the the root of, of where a lot of that desire came from. So I saw it in my grandpa, I saw it in my my dad, I saw it in my uncles, you know, and, and all these people that were doing their thing. And I was able to then uh, kind of venture down that path and it put me in a lot of different leadership opportunities. And, and I don't know if it was necessarily because I started at eight years old being a leader, right? I mean, I don't know if that you can figure it out at eight years old, but uh, definitely over time, trying to step into that and what that meant. And I think it was really when I, around 18, 19, 20, where I really started to figure out, hey, like there might be something here I can start to look at for myself. Can I jump in? Yeah. <laughs> so I have, a, it's a curious question for you that, you know, Lisa and I find ourselves now, we're doing this consulting business with digital marketing and whatnot. We find ourselves talking to CEOs who have accomplished significantly a lot more than I have, at least in terms of business world, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I sit across in their big comfy, well, when I used to, now it's all virtual, but in their big comfy <laughs> co uh, uh, executive office room. And I'm like, what am I doing here? What value do I have to add to them? Like, and then I start listening and I'm thinking about, wow, yeah, I actually run my own business. I've run a couple of mm -hmm. businesses for this, so I have a decent decorum of success. But when you're engaging with these high level CIOs and CEOs of company, and do you ever think like, what the hell do I have to offer them? Like, how, <laughs> how can I improve their life? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, that the term that often comes up when I, around that is imposter syndrome, right? And imposter syndrome is a very common thing across almost everyone. Chances are even that person that you're sitting across from and you're asking yourself the question about you know, what do I have to offer this person? They've probably asked that similar type of question in different kinds of situations, because I think we always have this little bit of a self doubt in a way like, oh, dude, what if they find out the truth about who I am, right? Like, I mean, what if they find out that I'm, I, I really just kind of woke up and barely put my pants on properly this morning, right? And and now, now I'm here kind of trying to present myself the best way that I can. And I think that it, I, I, for myself, what I, what I do for myself in those situations is I remind myself, couple things. One, what do I bring to the table? Because I think every experience that you bring to the table, regardless of where it's from, brings a new perspective to any situation, right? So whether that's leadership experience I've had in the past, whether it's it's any success or failure that I've had in, in business and in relationships and whatever the case is, that has all taught me different things. And also, do I, I don't need to be a million steps ahead of the people that I work with. If I'm trying to set that as a target, being a million steps ahead, uh, that's going to be impossible to reach. But is there some things that I, because of my journey, because of what I bring to the table, the expertise I have, where I'm a step or two ahead, and that is where I can help uh, provide some value for people that I talk to. And I don't need to have all the answers for them. That's not the goal. And and it, but it's, is there something that I can bring as value? And for you, when you're sitting down with people, it, it's it's the expertise that you bring that you, they might have a you know, $100 million business that they built, that's fantastic, right? Uh, good for them. There's not, no shame in acknowledging that they're an amazing person because they've done that. But how do we uh, just recognize that we do still bring some value to that equation or else why are we even having that, that meeting and that conversation? I find it interesting, like both of you in what you do bring that, that new perspective that when we are so in it and these businesses that you're consulting with, these individuals you're consulting with, when you are in the thick of things, you don't have that perspective to see as clearly as, as a professional like you both going in and seeing here's one, two, three things that you could change right away. And these are the steps that you need to take that, you know, you need a second set of, of professional eyes looking in on it. Yeah, well, and in many ways, like with with coaching like uh, with leadership coaching most of the time people have the answers inside them somewhere and so it's being able to ask the questions it's being able to share a little bit of that different angle with them and they often answer the question themselves or or at least get close to the answer themselves and and it might just take a little bit of prodding and pulling and and, and pointing them in the right direction and that's that's what i love doing 
Yeah, so a couple of things, and we actually have a couple of questions we want to jump into, but I, from a, I did a lot of the readings of the presentations that you have on your website, just kind of getting to know you through your LinkedIn posts. And one of the things that you talked about is how leadership is really based upon how we handle situations. It's not always based upon being right or necessarily wrong. It's how we handle the situations and the efficacy and the, ur- not necessarily the urgency, but I guess the efficacy of how we stick to our decision. So instead of like waffling back and forth on something, right? Well, I think a lot of it is that oftentimes we know what is the right answer to do deep down inside or even not even deep down inside. Like we know when I get up in the morning and I got to do something, I know I have to go and and do this. Got to swallow the frog. That's a term that's often used in in kind of, you know. (laughs) In term, I'm I'm not familiar with it. (laughs) The idea behind it is that we know there's stuff that we need to do. Sometimes it sucks, right? And so swallowing the frog is doing that hard thing and oftentimes we know what that hard thing is that we need to do but we don't want to do it so we go you know turn on netflix or we go and and you know waste time on youtube or or whatever the case is and rather than swallowing the frog and doing what we need to do and so you need to make the most of every opportunity you have you need to make the most of each moment and do the stuff you know you need to do because really we know like i know when i'm not getting the stuff done i need to get done and i'm i struggle with this too i i know that i should be doing it now, if I'm not taking that opportunity, and I think this is a great time to kind of really um, analyze that for ourselves during this COVID-19 uh, crisis or pandemic that we're in here, is how am I taking every opportunity that's in front of me and using it to the maximum effectiveness so that when I get to the end of it all, this is going to be a, I'm going to be better off than where I was. I don't want my legacy of during the pandemic to be that I binged 23 shows on Netflix or 23 seasons on Netflix, right? I mean... We, we might need to do that, de-stress a little bit, right? That's okay. I'm not saying don't de-stress. But if that's the legacy that I've built into my leadership and to my impact, wow, I'm missing out on some great opportunities to really build into myself and others. Yeah, but a lot of the stuff that you're talking about and Jessica as well, it's not just pandemic and COVID-19 related. These are things that you should be developing and nurturing now so that when we do get back out yeah. on the streets, when we do get back the opportunity to run our businesses in a physical realm, we can do that. But a lot of what you say is stuff that can be implemented now in a virtual capacity. So that's what I'm really excited to hear. So um, in terms of the two of you, the reason you're on the podcast today, I'm just making a slight pivot there. Okay. So the reason we brought you both on the show, normally we let you have your own platform and we do a lot of Q&A and just kind of back and forth interrogative questions. But I'm really fascinated by the the model of what we live in right now. So you know, Jessica, you're a relationship, you're a therapy, you're a therapist, you're a, a couples coach. Ben, you're an executive leadership coach, you're a development coach, but you're also, you know, from high level executives down to, you know, managers, people who are just looking for self-improvement in their business game, because I see you offer like a mastermind course, so to speak as well. So, which I'd like to talk about that. So let's fast forward to today, right? You're suddenly thrust into these new roles, which really it kind of is. It's a, it's a new role for a lot of people. It's a new role for people who went to work every morning at 5 a.m. and didn't have to be isolated at home with their children. It's a new role for couples who are suddenly thrown into the same kitchen at the same time and the same dinner table and the same lunch table and the same bathroom and all these different things that you may have been in a relationship with someone before but you didn't necessarily always share the same space. And I can speak for one, when I was first married, I didn't always spend a lot of time at the house because I just didn't really want to be there. And, mm-hmm. and we talked about this before, like how do you navigate the space from the world you lived in where you kind of had a lot of autonomy, a lot of self-government, you know, you could get to go out and do your own coffee or in the morning or do whatever it is that you do. And now suddenly you're thrust into this space with a partner, which we hope you like, but let's pretend maybe you don't actually get along that well. And we're going to talk about that. And you know, like, how do you come out of this on the other end without or maybe, killing? Yeah, there's screaming kids. There's the financial stress. There's, or maybe you're not even with your partner or with you know your other employees. You're separated, so that motivation, like you've got both realms of it. So without hypnotizing us, Jessica, you first. <laughs> how, what are three key takeaways that as couples? we could sit down and think about, okay, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about this and let's talk about that. Yeah, well, I think it's just a really interesting time because I think you mentioned, Lisa, earlier that it's really like a make or break for a lot of couples, a lot of families right now because, um, and also what you were saying, Ben, like if you don't have these skills set in place of how to, okay, how do I emotionally regulate? How do I self-soothe? How do I be a leader in this situation? Like how do I you know, come face to face with this, communicate properly, 
um, that could really impact your relationship in a very negative way. So learning these skills right now, especially is so crucial in that sense, because, you know, our routines are getting disturbed. Our lifestyle is disturbed. Um, a lot of us don't have work. A lot of us are working from home. And, you know, in the past, it was so ideal for us to, you know, spend all the time with our partners, spend all the time with our kids, all the time at home. Like that was like a big goal for people. And now that we, you know, the, our wish came true, this dream came true, it's been a nightmare. It's been a complete nightmare for people. So how do we, you know, what skills can we harness so that we can better cope with what's happening, you know, um, join our partner, you know, become leaders together. How can we do this together? Or if it's not being reciprocated, whoa, perhaps we might have different values. Perhaps we might, you know, might not be compatible, you know, because we don't have those distractions anymore. So we're being faced with a lot of real issues about ourselves and our relationships. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and it, it reminds me, so there, um, just briefly to highlight a study that was done in, in the business world, but I think it applies to relationships and, and, and connections wherever we might be, whether it's in our work, whether it's in our communities, whether it's in our homes. Uh, Gallup did this study uh, and they asked uh, people, what do you need from your leaders? So they didn't ask CEOs. They didn't ask you know, these big celebrity you know, leaders or politicians or whoever, they asked the people who are in these organizations, what do you want from your leaders? And in the short version of, of the results, they came up with four key words. And they said, followers said that they want uh, trust, compassion, stability, and hope yes. from their leaders. And, yeah. and it's interesting because I've been talking to a lot of people about this recently. And those are four things that as people, we want in our relationships, with, regardless of where we're working, right? If we don't trust the person that we live with, yeah. What kind of relationship is that? If we don't feel like there's compassion, if we don't feel like we have a stable home or stable relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if we don't have hope that there's something that we're working towards that can draw us together, whether that's your workplace, whether that's your home, whether that's your kids. I mean, we got to grow into those four types of things in order to be able to be successful. And I think that's a key thing that we, we need to really wrestle through. Yeah, 100%. I was actually reading that study yesterday um, because you mentioned it when I was reading yeah. those four, you know, those values. I was, yeah, that's exactly what I want in my relationship. That's, I think that's what a lot of people need in their relationships, whether it's yeah. romantic or it's, you know, Absolutely. work. Yeah, definitely. So as the groundwork for that, I asked that question again, going into it, I just found out that I'm going to be locked in this house. This is like a, that reality show where you, what is it called? Where you're locked in a home for like seven big, months. Big brother. <laughs> so now we're locked. Yeah, maybe something like that. But you're locked in a home now with somebody in essence. Okay. What are three things that Lisa and I can do today, or anyone else who listens to this, that can do today as they live in couple to be organized, be efficient, stay in love, be productive, not get fired if, or if we have an employer, that sort of stuff. Three things from both of okay. your perspectives. There's a couple things, but um, you know, with my clients and with myself, something that's completely transformed my life is a therapeutic technique, cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's, it's very popular. It's a scientifically proven, um, you know, to really reduce depression, anxiety, and any like life stressors. But basically there's this, and I'll post this on the Facebook group, like the diagram so people can see it. But it just, it just says that, you know, our thoughts impact our feelings, which then impacts the, the choices, the behaviors we make, right? So if you can look at that trying, and those create our patterns, like those three components are working in our life all the time to create our reality. So if you can, and you can apply this to any area of your life, but if you can just step back, like notice your triggers, what is bothering me in my family right now? What is bothering me about my, my spouse or my partner? Notice what the trigger is, even if you have to write it down and write down what the thought is. What is that thought that's bothering you? What's the feeling that it's, creating in you and after that feeling what what action do you take how do you react so if it's causing you um you know anger you might react by yelling like yelling at your kids yelling at your spouse or or retreating like a lot of people have this avoidant behavior and they'll just be on the phone all day or they'll just watch tv all day that it's more of like an avoidant behavior so kind of noticing what are your patterns and then I use mindful self-compassion. So it's another technique. And it's, um, you know, when you have that thought that's, that's triggering you, it's going to make you feel a certain way and more of like a destructive way. 
um, using mindful self-compassion. So talking to yourself in a loving way, um, self-soothing, you know, like for instance, you know, Hey Jess, um, I know that you're feeling this way, labeling the anger, labeling the emotion so that you can separate yourself from it and talk and just kind of self-soothing. So talk to yourself in a loving way so that it kind of calms your nervous system. And then you can decide a, a different way of reacting that doesn't create the same situation, right? Do I talk that same way to my partner? Hey, Lisa, I know that you're feeling this way. I'd like to acknowledge those feelings. I mean, how beautiful is that to talk to someone that way? Because then your def your defenses don't rise, right? Like if someone attacks you, you're going to attack back. So when you're talking and, you know, you're paying attention to your tone, to your wording, to your language, and you're speaking in a soothing way, it's just you can't fight over that really, you know? So it's that whole language piece that you just touched on is brilliant because, and I see a couple of people writing comments over here, it, your thoughts become your beliefs around who you are. And the, but those thoughts generate from things that you hear or things that you pick up or things that you say to yourself. So that's a brilliant point to, to bring in. Yeah. yeah. And it also works interchangeably that triangle. So some people have more of a feeling, right? They have a feeling which then turns into a thought, which then turns into an action. Other people can just impulsively act in a certain way. Like our habits tend to be very impulsive. There's not much thought behind it. So we can react We can react in a certain way without thinking, without feeling, which then leads to us feeling really shitty about our behavior, right? Which then, allow, you know, we go into this downward spiral of like, oh my God, why did I do that? And it's just this ongoing painful cycle. And if we're not aware of those patterns, then it could be destructive, but if we are aware of those patterns, we can change them. And mindful self-compassion is just such a great way to begin disrupting those, those painful patterns. Yeah. I, and that's, that's, I think Jessica, those are fantastic things. I appreciate those tools. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I have a little bit of a, um, experience working at home because I've been doing it for a while as an entrepreneur working out of my house and, and my wife's here. And one of the things that that just to kind of add on some some additional thoughts around that 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 I would encourage people to look at if they're kind of figuring this out, and it really applies again to even the context if your if your workplace is is now working virtually and you're in this new challenge as well. So whether it's with your spouse, your partner, or or whether it's with your workplace, communication is so important. And and, and I'm not always good at this, but as as a home now, whether it's your kids, your 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 partner, or whatever, how do you communicate more? than what you normally do about what's going on. I think that's a huge part. And using some of those tools you talked about, Jessica, fantastic. Those can kind of be parts of that conversation because often we don't like to talk about, uh, maybe it's 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 a little bit of a stereotype. We don't like to talk about our feelings, right? Or about our deep, our deep things uh, uh, inside of us. So communication, I think another thing is we need to give each other grace uh, in this. Like this is a unique time, right? So if someone loses their temper a little bit more than what they're used to, <laughs> We're going to have some of those things happen. We're going to go off. We're, we're in a stressful time period and it's affecting us even more than we realize. I think sometimes that there's all those different things through the media, through through the, what we're hearing that on the you know community gossip, whatever the case is, it's all affecting us. And so we need to give each other grace. And then the third thing I would say is be creative, be creative in how you, you go about and solve these things. Again, this, this applies to your workplace, too. Right. If you have a virtual team now. How are you going to be creative in building those trust, compassion, stability, and hope, even though you're you're working virtually? And that might mean something completely different than what you've ever done before. And maybe you have to kind of put on the back burner some of those things that you, you know, you're going to have a virtual meeting. And so the meeting starts and you start agenda item number one, you know, here's here's the task that we need to do. Maybe you need to change your agenda items in order to to be a little bit more focused on on people and, and on on compassion and culture in your organization. And if that takes half of your meeting, just talking about, hey, what's tough right now? I think that's fantastic. And maybe that's with your partner. What's what's tough right now for you? I think that's fantastic kind of conversation. It, it's kind of almost a reorganization of the rules, even if they're unwritten rules that go on in a household around whether it's chores, whether it's duties, whether it's responsibilities. I think a, a lot of people, especially if there is a stay at home person and a go to work person are used to kind of getting into a routine of maybe one person does all the inordinate amount of dishes and cooking and cleaning and all that sort of stuff. And the other person may have the yard duties, but maybe it's a period in maybe you, if you disagree that this is kind of a reorganization or at least a strong look at that that would carry that couple into the uh, new normal, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, 
with that reorganization, like Ben said, you need that clear communication. You need those two people to stand up and be leaders and take this responsibility and, you know, share these tasks because right now we have so many new responsibilities like taking care of kids all day, you know, doing these house chores. Um, so really developing that partnership is so important. And, but a lot of people aren't experiencing that, right? They're not getting that same reciprocation from their partner. So it's just such an interesting time because we're really dealing with like, okay, is this going to work or is this not going to work? But um, Ben, I wanted to say something about what you mentioned in terms of creativity. Um, you know, and right now too, with all the stressors, our nervous systems are just so riled up and we can't yeah. be creative when we're in fight or flight mode. Like there's just no way that creative, we can hear creativity. We can, um, you know, embody creativity. So there are some techniques you can, you know, do today, which I don't, I'm sure you guys are familiar with mindfulness. Um, and, you know, just really paying attention to the here and now, um, engaging in, you know, meditation. That's a great way, obviously, for mindfulness. Um, you know, drawing where you can really pay attention to the, the sensations of what you're doing. They have the mandala art. Um, a lot of people are doing that. Um, you know, taking walks, getting outside, being in nature. So really, um, incorporating those mindfulness activities in your life could be so helpful in terms of calming down the nervous system. Right. Ben, so I'm, I wanted to switch gears for a second because this is really more applicable to you. So you have a workforce that has traditionally gone to a brick and mortar. They've, you know, sat down at their cubicles and you, you're a manager and you have a small staff that you manage on a daily basis. And suddenly those 10 employees are now working from home. As, yeah. as a manager, if I want to be a, a leader, I want to be effective, I want to be able to keep my team productive. What are some of the considerations that I should take into now managing this new virtual workforce? Yeah, and, and I think the first thing that comes to mind is, is what I mentioned a little bit earlier around the communication side of things, right? So communication brings about engagement regardless of, of where you're working, right? So I mean, whether you're going back to bricks and mortar at the end of this all or whether you're going to be staying virtually, the more you can communicate, the better it is. If, if people don't feel like they're, they know what's going on, if they don't feel uh, what, what they, that they are a, a piece of the puzzle, it, it helps, it, 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 they struggle, right? They struggle with not knowing what to do, what's going on. They don't know if they, they're cared for. It kind of relates to that compassion and trust kind of component. So figure out how you can communicate maybe that's different than what you used to. Maybe you need to figure out, oh, do I need to do like a, a regular newsletter or a regular video update or a regular video meetings? I don't know. There's different ways for different kind of contexts, but communication, very important part of that. And the second thing is, is accountability and, and communicating and talking about expectations is going to be different virtually. Most workforces struggle with that already in the bricks and mortar context as to making sure expectations are clearly expressed, clearly communicated. Uh, so there's different studies around it, but, but roughly only 26% of employees strongly agree that their manager is good at helping clarify expectations. So only 26%. So that means that 74% of us are not very good at clarifying expectations. And most of the time, we think we're good at it, right? We think that we're, we've done a very good job. Oh yeah, it's obviously very clear. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm paying them to do their job. They should know what their job is, right? Mm -hmm. But so often the studies when we, when the employees are being talked to don't show that that is actually true. So there's a disconnect there. I think most of that is is we're not e expressing it clear enough, but we're also not communicating it often enough. And so we need to be better at that. So that'd be the second thing with your team and not in a negative way, like here's your expectations and let's make this a long list and we're gonna make sure that we, ex you know, but half of it is a conversation with, do you know what you're, what's expected of you. And we're going to have this conversation now because we're working virtually and it might be different, but what do these expectations look like for you and have a conversation. And then I think the third thing is because a lot of people now are going to be very isolated in their work context is you have to be a lot better as a leader, as a manager at individualizing how you deal with your, your team, because you, you, you'll have your team meetings, obviously virtually on zoom or whatever the case is. And, and but it, that's not the same as what it used to be. And you're going to have to figure out what does this individual need to be successful? How do I make sure I tap into, you know, John and what does John want? And then, oh, there's Sally over there. Yeah. Sally needs something different. And I need to be very good at trying to understand that, understand what makes them tick and then how to engage them more effectively in their roles. I think those are three things that, that come to mind for me. The Johns and the Sally's of the world are always going to pick on as exactly as I <laughs> That is so true. <laughs> so let's John. flip it around. 
as an employee, what are some of the things that I can do really just off the cuff, high level? This is not a vacation. And I, I actually know some people who think this is an extended vacation. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you will be on extended vacation if you don't pull up. Yeah. But like, what are some things as employees we can do to kind of get into that mindset and still be productive and valuable? A lot of people like to have that FaceTime with their bosses. And like, how do I still have that sort of relationship, if you will, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think a big part is as, as an employee asking that same question from the other end, what is expected of me? If you don't know what's expected of you, because three quarters of the employees don't know what's expected of them right now. So chances are a lot of people listening to this might be in that situation. If you don't know what's expected of you, what's wrong with asking your, your boss, your, your, your supervisor, whatever the case is, just say, hey, can we just go over this? It's, it, we're in a new world here right now. Can we just make sure I understand? And I think that's one part of it. And the second thing is you, you, there's going to be times at home because working at home is a different beast altogether where you can be okay with not calling it a vacation, but be okay with saying, I need to have a little bit more flexibility and grace in what I do about, here at home because I have kids in the background that are making noises. And so being okay with it and saying, I need to get up and go deal with some, some of that right now because they're there. They just walked in on my meeting and whatever. So you might need to you know, go and handle what the, what's going on there. And I think those are kind of things where you need to have those conversations with your workplace to say, is that going to, do you get that? Do you understand that I need this? And most workplaces are going to get it, right? They're not going to say, you need to sit at your desk for eight hours straight in front of your monitor. And if I, you know, I'm going to have this be watching you through the camera. And if you're not at your desk the whole time, you're going to get fired. I think that there needs to be some conversation back and forth and it might need to be triggered by you as an employee. And that's okay. Mm. I like the piece at the beginning of a lot of what you said about, you know, the four pillars you talked about um, communication and expectations and all of that kind of carries over on both sides from a relationship perspective as well as from a corporate perspective. So let's, let's say you have, um, did you have, I'm, I'm going to ask still, one more, uh, more jump in. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I got it. Okay. Well, I guess this probably applies to both of you as well. And Ben, you might've just already answered all of that, but um, Jessica is wondering like, Prior to COVID and now, what have been the three biggest relationship stumbling blocks that you've found um, when you've been dealing with, with your clients? What are the three big things? Are they still the same now with that? And, and how do you address them? Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, right, I, there, there's so many things that can, can be involved. Obviously, just that's kind of like, a, could be like a loaded question, but, um, you know, a lot of platform that ben we had. can answer yeah. that. Facebook after I just, you know, it, it. yeah, yeah, I think stress, right? Stress is really what can tear people apart. And I was reading a study too, and it talks about it's not what people fight about, it's how they fight, like how they argue. So that's why the communication piece is so important to learn to develop that skill so that you could express your needs, right? We all have emotional and physical needs. And really getting in touch with what that is and learning how to express that. But yeah, just stressors in general, money is, you know, money arguments is what tears people apart. That's like the number one um, reason why people divorce is money. But um, there's, there's so many things that could be involved. But really, it's if you don't have that proper, clear communication, that could really be detrimental to the relationship. So it's so important. It's so important to learn how to, A, know what your values are, know what your needs are, and to not be afraid to communicate that. But that takes work because we've been afraid to communicate our needs based off of like family and, you know, our past. So how do we get in touch with that and feel like, oh, it's okay for me to ask for what I need. It's okay for me to, um, yeah, to communicate this to my partner. And at work, like now, you guys, there's such a crossover. Yeah. I know so everything Ben is saying. I'm like, okay, he's speaking <laughs> my language. So, well, I mean, I think the key, the, the reason why it crosses over so well is that we're, whether you're, you know, with a, with your partner or, or whether you're at work, it's people, yeah. right? People are the right. same regardless of where you're at. They, they have the same types of needs, and relationships, regardless of where you're at, can be hard. Yeah. That's one of the hardest things about the human existence, right? Relationships. That's wars have been fought over relationships. 
<laughs> yeah, and all the stuff that both of you are saying, it doesn't just stay confined. Again, I, I used it earlier as an analogy, the New Year's resolutions. It, it doesn't just stay confined to the corona situation. These are things that you should be doing anyway as a communication exactly partner or as a boss or you know there's all there's countless studies on there ben and you talked a little bit about it in terms of what makes a great leader what makes a great manager and in every situation it's kind of you don't it's just like your kids you don't raise or manage your kids in the exact same way one of my daughters is literally night and day different from my other daughter and and how i parent them as a parent is is completely different and so as a great leader as a great manager as a great partner as a great couple you have to be in tune with what your team with what your partner with what your spouse your kids what do they bring to the table i love that you said that what do they bring to the table and build on those strengths as opposed to focusing on any of their weaknesses they have well and that's a major part of what i do with my leadership coaching i use one of the tools put out by gallup it's a clifton strengths assessment or, or strengths finder assessment and that's exactly the whole theory behind it is that when people are able, and this applies to at home, I think as well, when people are able to bring to the table what they actually are good at and use it effectively in the workforce, they're much more engaged, they're much more productive, they're much more successful, even in how they relate to their customers. It relates to the home as well. If your children are able to recognize what they bring to the table and how you can now draw them out as their parent, they're gonna be a lot more satisfied and happy and, and enjoy their life at home. That's the same thing with whether you're you know, with your partner. It's how do you actually tap into what they bring to the table, give them the opportunity to use it. They're going to be more satisfied too. We have about a hundred more questions for each of them that we haven't even <laughs> that, mean, that, that means they both have to come back on. So should we jump into hot seat? Before we jump into hot seat, um, if somebody can, I don't know if you have it, Amala, can you put up on the Facebook, we have a Facebook group where both of you are going to go in for 10 minutes after. And if anybody wants to chat with you privately, um, if Amelie, you could put that up on the screen so everybody knows where it is. All right. So honestly, I, I did have like five or six pages of things that I yeah. wanted to kind of <laughs> talk about. Um, it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting time. This whole period in of itself, it, it's it's um, it's interesting. It's a small microcosm of, of a bunch of billion different types of topics and hot buttons for people. So yeah, but I I also think that a lot of people are going to come to the other side of it. I think sometimes we we focus on negativity, but I think a lot of people will come to the other side with yeah more skills more just more to offer if they if they use it as an opportunity yeah. and don't just focus on negativity. I have we've talked about it. We all know some a lot of people who have just are are, are allowing the fear that's being rammed down their throats to become. The, the focus for what life is about. And and those are the people who are not going to make it on. But it can be a calling of sorts. And I don't mean to peop, for people specifically, but a calling of those things in your life that aren't working, those things in your business that aren't working, streamlining things, simplifying things, those things that are important, those things that aren't. It's a horrible word to say, culling, but <laughs> it's like, what's that movie where they did the... Yeah, let's not get into that. Well, but. Yeah, so... <laughs> But it's again, it's another small microcosm on the, I said the word twice, but it's a microcosm of the Corona in of itself. It's like, what is the, it, what is the other side of this look like? And it's a new normal. And everyone thinks that, you know, I just, I keep seeing it, especially across social media. I just can't wait till things get back to normal. They are not going to get back to normal. There's going to be a completely new paradigm presented to us when this eventually slowly opens up. So. Okay. Hot seat. Thank you for being part of this. I've uh, <laughs> fantastic content. I hope that we, we at least added a few value because there's so many more and morsels that we could have touched yeah. on. Yeah. All right. So I'll see this is how it works. We're going to alternate back and forth. You're going to ask Jessica first. And then uh, do you want to make them both answer? Uh, okay. Fair enough. Because then that gives one of them thought to think about. All right. You want to read the first yeah. question? Would you rather be in jail for a year or lose one year of life? Uh, in jail for a year. Lose a year of life. <laughs> Are you always 10 minutes late or 20 minutes early? 20 minutes early. 20 minutes early. <laughs> you passed the test. <laughs> Would you rather have all traffic lights you approach turn green or never have to stand in a line again? Never have to stand in a line. Never. I could go never either way, but I'll stand in a line. Yeah, never yeah. have to stand in a line. Like I'm with the line. I hate standing in line. <laughs> all right. Would you rather have unlimited international first class airline tickets or never have to pay for food at a restaurant again? Never have to pay for food at a restaurant again. You know, I, I would like to say the, the, the airline tickets, but you know, if I wouldn't want to leave my family that often, unless they came with me, I would say the airline tickets. <laughs> so 
<laughs> food at the restaurant. So if you took the other option, you and Jessica would be having private conversations about something. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it's a lose-lose. I don't know. <laughs> What's worth, laundry or dishes? Dishes. Laundry. <laughs> because you have a family. Right? <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. I don't mind, I don't mind laundry. Laundry. putting it away. I don't mind dishes. That's not too bad. All right. This one's a little bit deeper and esoteric. If you had to sum up the entire human species in three words or less, what would those words be? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and you're not giving us time to think about an answer. Oh, man. Okay. Complicated human race. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 she took a good answer, so I don't know if I have a better one than that. But I think there's an aspect of it of, of we all have, this is too many answers. Um, <laughs> it, issues, yeah. um, <laughs> it, issues is part of it. And yet also lots of good things. There you go. That's close enough. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> one law you would abolish if you could. Wait, say Sorry. that again, Lisa. Name one law you would abolish if you could. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> no filters. <laughs> I mean, it, I don't know. In California, you can't take your dogs to the beach. A lot of beaches don't. You can't take your dogs. So I would probably say that's just a terrible one. I have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like dogs, it's honest. Like it's honest. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with that one because I can't really think of anything at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I, nothing comes to mind of like, I'm sure that if this wasn't the hot seat, I'd have yeah, conversations exactly. around something I'd want to get rid of that. that yeah, you're going to be like, ah, I should have said that. Yeah. That uh, always happens. It's a sign to I, I think I'd add a law. I'd add a law that people who want to shop at Costco need to learn how to push their shopping carts around Costco properly without getting in the way of each other. That law should Horrible. exist. That's a federal law. <laughs> Jessica, Shopping and, cart rage. <laughs> Jessica, yeah. answer that same question because that was actually our next question. What's one law you would put into effect if you had universal supreme power? Mm, taking your dog to every beach. You can take <laughs> the dog everywhere. <laughs> <Beach box. laughs> if you could go back in time and give your parents one piece of advice before you were born, what advice would that be? Get mental health help. <laughs> <laughs> be a therapist. Oh, that would be a law. Everyone should have a therapist, probably, so that we could all, yeah, work on our mental health. Jessica might like this one. I would tell my parents, don't torment your kids about their relationships they're trying to figure out. Oh, I like that Ooh. one. Uh, all right, last question, and then you, you get to be free. If you could pick one item that you could universally grow on trees anywhere, <laughs> what would it be? Money. Money. <laughs> but we can't pick money. That's too easy. Come on. Uh, money shouldn't be the answer. You're right, uh, Ben. You're right. Um, <laughs> wishing for three more wishes from a genie lamp. Exactly. You can't say money. Um, Good question. Good question. <laughs> okay. um, so I would say, I mean, universally grow on trees. I know this does grow on I, some kind of plant. I don't know what kind, but I'm going to... Jessica was drinking this before we started matcha. So I've started to drink matcha and it's expensive to buy good matcha. So if I could grow universally grow easily in my backyard, matcha leaves that are high quality matcha leaves. I don't even know what that means, but then I could have matcha whenever I want to. Cause I just ran out a couple days ago and it's expensive to rebuy. So let me tell you matcha leaves. Growing season though. In Canada, we wouldn't, in Winnipeg area here, we probably couldn't grow it in our backyard very easily, but in, I'd grow it inside then if I could. All right, should we let them go? Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate <laughs> taking the time. To, the Facebook link is over here on the message board. If anybody wants to join and ask you specific questions, we're not allowed to join because we have a lot more questions and we dominate. <laughs> but you can, you want to just quickly give out your handles, uh, either Facebook or website. So your Cantera Leadership and Jessica. Your is it the Jessica De Silva, Jessica De Silva coaching .com, correct? Yeah, Jessica De Silva coaching .com. And Cantera, Cantera leadership .com, yeah. Cantera. And one one R in Cantera 
don't don't get mixed up on that. <laughs> well, you're fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, you so much. Great conversation. Thanks for hosting us. And uh, Jessica, thanks for sharing your wisdom there too. Lots of good tidbits. Yes. Thank you so much, right. guys. Thank you. Fantastic day. And thank you for joining us for those of you who are on the live. Bye. Hello, you're listening to Connect, Collaborate and Create with Lisa and Devo. Each week on our podcast, we will discuss and dissect ways we are attempting to live our best life through our business, our personal lives and connections and relationships we forge that make us successful.